evening. Um, this is the butcher's robbery scene from Finer Things, take, I think, 17. After they disembarked on Ealing Broadway, Rita led the way through a series of back alleys until they emerged onto an affluent shopping street. They stopped outside a florist's. Pretending interest in a bucket of white roses, Rita tilted her head to indicate a butcher's on the opposite side of the road. That's the one, she said. A few shoppers, mainly housewives and pensioners, ambled up and down the street. There was a bank here, Tess noticed. A jeweller's, too. Butchers had money, she supposed. Like the one who had bought the picture from her fellow student in Leeds. She focused her attention on the details of the shop. It was called Faraday and Son Family Butchers. In the window, a grinning automaton in a striped apron raised and lowered his cleaver again and again. The motto, Please to meet you, meet to please you, had been painted in white along the bottom of the glass. She could see clearly what was happening inside the shop. The proprietor, a young man, more likely son than Faraday, reached into the window display, lifted out a string of grey-skinned sausages and carried them to his scales. On the other side of the counter, a queue of customers waited patiently, all well-to-do women, some accompanied by children, some not. Doctors' wives, accountants' wives, professional wives. Before the war, they would have kept servants to do their shopping and cooking for them, now they were fending for themselves. Here he comes, Delia said. Tommy the Spade! Rita spoke the name under her breath, but it was an announcement. Tommy the... Before Tess finished her question, she saw the answer. In the form of the person heading up the road towards them on an old delivery bicycle. Tommy the Spade was heavy and swarthy. A massive man of the type in whom muscle and fat were indistinguishable from each other. And he was too big for the bike. He rode standing on the pedals, rocking from side to side. Sweat ran liberally down his face. He carried two large empty shoulder bags with their straps crossed over his chest. Along the top of the handlebars he held a garden spade, reminding Tess of a tightrope act. Look at him go! Rita cackled with delight and clapped her hands as Tommy the Spade jumped his bicycle up the curb and onto the pavement, scattering a few pedestrians from his path. An old man in a tweed suit stomped furiously towards him. Tommy turned his back and leaned the bike against the butcher's window. Though physically tiny, the old man seemed used to the deference of others. He drew himself to his fullest height and reached up to tap Tommy on the shoulder. Tess thought he might be a retired army officer, or perhaps just a lifelong bully. Young fellow, he began. Tommy spun around, swung the spade above his head like a war hammer, and let out a hideous bellow. How swiftly the world could be overturned. Tommy's roar and that upward sweep of his spade changed the meaning of everything. Passers-by became witnesses. A garden tool became a murder weapon. Everything froze into testimony. This awful thing was about to happen in front of these people, in front of their children, and nothing would prevent it. Tess knew with absolute certainty that she was about to see a human head smashed open with a garden spade, hear the wet crunch of steel through bone. Yet she neither shut her eyes nor put her hands over her ears. After that moment, events lurched for a while in strange discontinuity from one completed tableau to another. Now the terrified old man hadn't been killed after all. He had landed on his backside and sat on the pavement, his skull unexpectedly intact. Now Tommy was inside the shop, directing the butcher to empty the cash register into one bag, pointing out all the cuts of meat he wanted to go into the other. Now, Rita said, I asked him to get me some nice pork chops. I hope he remembers. 
Now, exiting the butchers, Tommy stepped gently over the still-dazed old man and remounted his bike. Now he dropped his spade to the pavement, and as the clang it made died away, Tess became aware of the bells of distant police cars. Now Tommy, spadeless, dangerously imbalanced by the two stuffed bags he carried, wobbled away on his bicycle. Now Delia was no longer by Tess's side. She was helping the old man back to his feet. Now she was back with Tess and Rita. Poor sod's in a right state, she said. I bet that'll give him nightmares for months. And time began running normally again. Bystanders unfroze. Someone from the bank brought out a chair for the old man and he sat on it. A woman brought him a cup of tea and he sipped at it. The butcher came out of his shop and stood staring at the spade on the pavement as if it could provide some explanation of what had just happened. The injury Tommy had inflicted on this place had already begun to heal over. Time to go, Rita said. As the women escaped into the same side street by which they had arrived, three police cars drew up outside the butchers.